Tonight's story is called The Fault in Our Stars, but it's not that book. Like many kids, I dreamed of meeting a real-life celebrity. I kept a shoebox under my bed filled with celebrity news clippings, alphabetized by last name, from Abdul, comma, Paula, to Zeering, comma, Ian. My collection of TV Guide articles and parade snippets were very, very organized. I'd met a Christian inspirational singer or two, which made me feverish with excitement. Our family friend Jerry Jenkins, later very famous himself for co-writing the Left Behind series, was authoring an autobiography of Christine Wurzen, a singer I'd listened to a lot growing up. Her albums had very little sin-tinged guitars or Satan-driven drums, so I could actually listen to them out loud with my parents' home. One night, after a concert she performed in Grand Rapids, Jerry arranged for Ms. Wurzen to actually come over to our house. What? How does a boy dress for this? Should I wear some of my father's aftershave? I put her records on in the background, you know, to show that I was a true fan. My mom wisely ran over to the record player and whipped the needle off the record. Danny, that may be overzealous. I doubt she wants to listen to her own music. I was a little too eager to impress celebrities, I guess. I kept this in mind as I got closer and closer to meeting my first ever TV star, Mark Price, also known as Erwin Skippy Handelman on Family Ties. This was during the heyday of the NBC Top 10 sitcom, and the fact that Skippy was coming to sign autographs at the Grand Village Mall blew my mind. It wasn't exactly Michael J. Fox, but still, Skippy! I admired him the way we admired everyone who was on TV in the 80s. There were only four networks besides PBS, and who knew if this Fox network was really going to last? Basically, if an actor was a regular on primetime TV, everyone knew who he was, or at least who his character was. That's why, to this day, if I say Belky Bartokamas or Blair Warner or Peg Bundy to anyone over 40, they know exactly who I'm talking about. I was counting down the weeks to the fairy tale Saturday when I would meet Mark Price. Family Ties was still in production, so I had no idea how or why he had cleared his busy schedule to fly to Michigan to meet a bunch of snot-nosed fans in skinny leather ties, pegged parachute pants, and swatch watches. I wasn't old enough to drive yet, and I knew meeting a, quote, left-wing, liberal Hollywood type was not on my dad's agenda. For all he knew, this Mark Price could be a fruity actor just pretending to have a crush on Mallory Keaton. So I planned my big day down to the last detail, even arranging my own travel accommodation. Five days before my first real celebrity encounter, it was announced at a family meeting that we would all be traveling to Wisconsin to visit my great-grandma Loading for her 90th birthday party. I was livid. What was the big deal about turning 90 anyway? Old people do it all the time. I attempted to fight the decision, but it was a losing battle. I was going to Wisconsin no matter how much I threw a hissy fit, and I would never again have a shot at meeting a TV star. Usually, I was a delightful grandson who respected, even sucked up to, my elders. But this particular weekend, I had a nasty, resentful attitude toward my great-grandmother. Are you learning any nice things in school, Danny? She asked as she slowly chewed on a grape, one little nibble at a time, as if a grape requires multiple bites. Did you know we all studied in the same room? All grades together, honest to Pete. And our only bathroom facility was an outhouse. She slowly clawed the skin of the grate back with her two good teeth. I slumped on the floral print Davenport and stared at the oldest living member of my family, glaring at her gray hair down to her orthopedic shoes and thought this is why I'm not meeting Skippy from Family Ties to listen to you prattle on about crapping outdoors in 1905. Looking back I'm not proud of that thought but in my defense I was 14. 
When I was a senior in high school, my family visited some kind of Christian retreat center in Colorado. I'm sure it had something to do with restoring America or putting God back into it or something. God was always hiding out in cryptic locations and we were always trying to lure him back. At this retreat, I met producer Edward W. Flanagan from James Dobson's Focus on the Family organization. He had produced a kid's cartoon series called Adventures in Odyssey, which I had heard of, and he told our group how he was about to film an abstinence documentary with the freshly born-again star of Growing Pains, Kirk Cameron. The connection between God and a legitimate Hollywood celebrity blew my 18-year-old mind. I had been collecting photos of Kirk Cameron for quite some time. I was a big fan of the show, an even bigger fan of his adorably crooked smile. Kirk was my Chachi, my Fonz, my Beatles, my Elvis. I was never satisfied with my own low to middling teenage looks and was always wanting to reinvent myself. In seventh grade, I purchased a dark purple button-up shirt because I'd seen Tony Danza rock one on Who's the Boss. Maybe the color purple was the secret to having biceps. In eighth grade, I decided I needed a new smile, something that would thin out my lips. I loved Kirk's smile, so I did what any healthy young boy would do. I taped a photo of Kirk Cameron, carefully culled from Pop Magazine, to the bathroom mirror and practiced his smile in the mirror for at least a half hour. We headed down to Sears Portrait Studio to get our family photo for the church directory. The photographer placed me in the back row, standing over the shoulders of my mom and dad and sisters. The stranger behind the camera had no idea what my natural smile was, so he never told me to knock it off, whatever weird thing I was doing with my mouth as he snapped the pictures. My impression of Kirk Cameron's thin-lipped smile did not go over with my mom two weeks later when we received the proofs in the mail. She had spent days pulling together the family photo shoot, choosing outfits, running brushes through my sister's rat's nest hair, and getting everyone to behave and get this over with. And in the end, her goofy, insecure son is found in every shot, standing in the back row and doing some insane ear-to-ear smile, looking like Jack Nicholson's Joker in Batman. I'd never seen her more mad at me. It was so bad we had to schedule another photo shoot and do it all over again just because of my terrible impression of Kirk Cameron's handsome smile. This time it was very clear I was under no circumstance allowed to alter my God-given big-lipped smile. So now with this history, you understand what a jackpot opportunity it was to meet Kirk Cameron on the Focus on the Family documentary. After the seminar, I approached the producer and told him about my extensive resume as a teen producer of Danny the Clown Show and Adventures in Learning. He said if I was willing to get myself to Valencia, California, I was welcome to intern on the film. There would be no pay or reimbursement for lodging or guarantee I would ever meet Kirk Cameron. Uh, But that, I was welcome to be part of it. One last question. Did I personally believe in waiting until my wedding night to have sex? This was a pivotal question to answer correctly, as the project was called Sex Lies in the Truth. No need to purchase a VHS copy. You can find it on YouTube. The documentary opened with a creepy slow motion shot of walking through a carnival, likening the act of premarital sex to tripping out on acid. I'm proud to say I hung some of the lights at that carnival. I spent my graduation money to fly to California for the first time and stay at my great aunt Dolores' condo in Pasadena. She had worked as a devoted secretary for decades at Fuller Christian Seminary, but now resided in a nursing home. Her place just sat there, full of canned goods she wanted me to consume. I think down deep she knew she would never return to her condo. After a few days, I took a Greyhound bus to Valencia to intern on the documentary. I had stars in my eyes and visions of shaking hands with my main teen crush. I never met Kirk Cameron during my two-night stint on the movie. I did get to hang carnival lights with a woman who had been a production designer on Beverly Hills 90210. That was just one degree of separation from Ian Ziering, which was something. 
I didn't see a wedding ring on this 52-year-old woman's fourth finger. Did she also have to declare her virginity? Had the producers required her to clarify a moral stance on abstinence? Doubtful. My two-week trip to Los Angeles gave me a taste for what my future would hold. It was I wasn't old enough to rent a car, so I took public transportation everywhere. I took a tour of Par Paramount and visited the set of Cheers in its final season, filmed on stage 25. That was a thrill. When the Paramount tour guide forgot the name of the actor who played Coach, I blurted out, Nicholas Colasanto, like the little obnoxious know-it-all I was. I also attended a taping of the Arsenio Hall Show, but managed to keep my big mouth shut, except for when I was encouraged to woof it up in the dog pound. While planning my visit to L.A., I had hoped to meet a real producer who might mentor me and ultimately offer me a writing job. This kind of naivete is the exclusive privilege of the young. I had done my homework and was already writing spec scripts that would show my talent, but at that point, my comedy writing was still at a stage where I was unintentionally ripping off jokes from people I admired. I'd scripted a bad Seinfeld sample script that had George Costanza getting a job handing out condoms in Central Park only to accidentally give one to... Bum, bum, bum. A nun. <laughs> I had a lot to learn, but that didn't stop me from calling one of my favorite companies, Miller Boyett Productions. I had heard of a Christian professional, Michael Warren, who was the executive producer of some of my favorite childhood shows, Perfect Strangers and Family Matters. Hi, my voice quivered. Is Michael Warren there? May I ask who's calling? Um, my name is Dan, and I'm a producer of a public access TV show in Grand Rapids called Danny the Clown Show. And I also did a series called Adventures in Learning that's kind of popular with preschoolers around here. And I'm heading out to Hollywood in a few weeks using my graduation money, and I'm wondering if Mr. Warren would like to meet me and give me some advice. Oh, and I'm a Christian, and I know he is too. Silence on the other end. Then I heard the receptionist put her hand over the phone. Michael, some Christian boy wants to meet you in a few weeks. What? what? Really? She came back on the line. Uh, yeah, I guess he'll meet with you. Let's set up an appointment. I was floored. Was Hollywood really this easy, this friendly? I played the faith card and it, it worked. I had an appointment with a very legit producer. I stepped off the LA Metro bus at 12.20 p.m. in Culver City and confidently marched up to the guard gate, my erudite briefcase in hand. I wore my best jean shirt with a purple tie, loosely open to convey the casual breeziness of a budding comedy writer. The security guy looked me up and down with an arched eyebrow. I'm not sure he had ever seen such a young man carry a hard shell, brass clasped, briefcase before. I'm here for a meeting with Mr. Michael Warren at Miller Boyett, I announced. Where's your car? asked the guard, slowly chomping down on his spearmint gum. The smell permeated his booth. Uh, I don't have one. I rode the bus. He laughed, then checked his records, and to his surprise, discovered that I did have a meeting set. The next moment encapsulates the funniest visual of who little Danny Stedman was at the time. The guard gate lifted and I walked through. Briefcase clutched in my right hand. I was in Hollywood and my future was staring me in the face. I was early, so I ate lunch at the commissary in front of stage four. Pretending to read Hollywood Reporter, I spent the whole time staring over my sunglasses, looking for stars. A team of writers sat nearby and talked about how Cheers had beaten the Democratic National Convention in the ratings. They also joked about the upkeep of Goldfish. I only remember because I kept a diary on a little pad of paper. I didn't want to miss a thing on my first Hollywood experience. An hour later, walking into Michael Warren's office, I noticed an Urkel pencil case, framed magazine covers of his shows, and the actual purple and green neon sign from the opening credits of Happy Days. 
Michael was a kind man who listened to my life story, then referred to as a testimony. Fortunately, he also spoke Christianese. I pitched him some half-assed idea, and I gave him my Seinfeld spec with the bad, cliched storylines. He gave me plenty of advice on how to break into the industry, but did not, after all, offer me a full-time job on one of his writing staffs. Before we were done, he casually asked, You have plans for this afternoon? Want to join me for a step-by-step run-through? I opened my empty briefcase and pretended to flip through my non-existent day planner. I'm free. Sounds like fun. He led me over to the soundstage and told me to make myself comfortable in the audience risers. It was the coolest feeling being an invited guest of the executive producer. In the first half hour, I overheard parents of the child stars complaining to the producers about how many lines their little brats did or didn't have. Her son has 11 lines in this episode and my daughter is only one in this scene. Her fans are going to be very upset about her lack of screen time. I thought my son's contract stipulated that he is to appear on screen for seven minutes per episode minimally. If that's the case, this show is in violation. How come my boy's reaction shot was cut out of last week's show? It was hilarious. Comedy gold just tossed on the editing room floor. You are wasting him. Did you know he just booked a Pauly Shore feature? You're going to regret not using him more. The poor assistant producer had to deal with these stage parents. I focused my eyes on the living room set, where hunky Patrick Duffy and ageless Suzanne Summers were blocking a scene. The two were total pros and really seemed to enjoy each other's company. At one point, Suzanne said something funny and I laughed. She looked up into the darkened audience section and held a hand over her eye to see who had guffawed. I was the only one there. She smiled and waved at me. I felt flush. I now had my Hollywood story. I laughed at Suzanne Summers and she waved at me. I milked this for the next year back home in Michigan, where I was already known as the guy who had talked to Phil Hartman on the phone, see chapter 14. It wasn't long before I came up with a new plan to hobnob with the sitcom stars of the day. I decided to try my hand at freelance journalism for local newspapers. My first big get happened when TV's Al Borland came to Michigan. I still hadn't learned my lesson on being overzealous, which is why I opened my shirt to reveal a home improvement t-shirt underneath. It's embarrassing to this day, and that's why I included it in the book. The photo was blown up to 5 by 7 and was promptly filed in my shoebox under K, subfolder, card, comma, Richard.